Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to stop stressing and start living, then do we have the Stress Less Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Kate Hanley, best-selling author, columnist, coach, and author of a fantastic new read to help you de-stress fast, stress less. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about the top 10 or more mindfulness exercises for calmness and clarity. That plus we'll talk about plugging energy leaks, unique times to meditate, slowing down to speed up, what it means to come from a long line of soakers, the power of hugs, <laughs> downward dogs in the closet, why you want to sing your brains out in the car, and what in the world orange bow ties have to do with anything. <laughs> Gotcha. So happy birthday and welcome to the show, Kate. Are you ready to shine? I am so ready, Michael. Thank you. That was an amazing introduction. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. A mighty woohoo for being on the show and happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. It is such an honor for you to join us here on your birthday. And I wonder, would you mind sharing how old you are and how old your kids are? Yes, totally. I am 47 years old today, and my kids are 9 and 7. Woohoo! Yes. And you were born in the same year I was then, 1970. Oh, really? We're both year of the dog. We are, and, and I'm a big canine at that. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. And so is my husband, by the way. Very cool. So if we go back in time, would you mind taking us back in a little time machine? We'll do kind of the Wayne's World to date ourselves. Do -do -do, do -do -do, do -do -do. Take us back to 1995, and what was your life like at that time? Okay. In 1995, I was working in my first real job. I graduated mm -hmm. from college in 91, and then I kind of bummed around for a year. And in 1992, I moved to San Francisco, and I found myself a job as an editorial assistant at a publishing company. And I um, was pretty psyched about that because I figured I, if I needed to be doing something where I had to sit in one spot every day for the rest of my life, <laughs> I needed to be reading and writing, mm -hmm. and yet I was um, just questioning, even, you know, I was having, I guess, maybe a quarter life crisis, sort of like, am I really going to be doing this every day for the rest of my life? I went on vacation with some girlfriends um, that summer, and I loaned my car to a friend because I was living in San Francisco at the time, and if you don't move your car from one side of the street to the other Good in San point. Francisco, you get a ticket because of street sweeping. So I loaned my car to a friend while we were gone, and the second I walked up the stairs to get home from that trip. The phone was ringing. I picked up the phone because, of course, this was before cell phones. And my friend who I'd loaned the car to said, oh, my God, I'm so glad I got you. I have terrible news. I have wrecked your car, and it is totaled. And I was like, was anybody hurt? And he said, no. And then, like, from there, I was just like, okay, nobody's been hurt. What does this mean? Mm -hmm. Well, what it ended up meaning was that I got a check for $11,000 in the mail because he had been rear-ended, so it wasn't his fault. Yeah. And, like, a good 25-year-old, I quit my job because I had been dying to get to yoga class. I had seen people doing yoga in the movie, the midnight express. Mm -hmm. If you remember that movie, um, I was watching it on late night TV one night, trying to sort of convince myself that I didn't have to go to work the next day. And there is a scene in the movie about a young American man who goes to Turkey and decides to smuggle drugs out of the country. Terrible idea. Gets thrown in Turkish prison. Disaster. Except there's this one scene in the movie that is not a disaster. He is doing yoga with his cellmate. They are doing sun salutations, and they are attractive young men who were not wearing shirts. So I will say that that definitely grabbed my attention, but it was the look on their face that just, even though they were in Turkish prison, it looked like they were free. So I had seen that movie maybe two years before, and I had been wanting to get to yoga class so badly, but I never could because... I worked, and the only time they had yoga at my gym was during the day. So in 1995, my car was totaled. I quit my job. The first thing I did was go to yoga class, and that was just so amazing to me because as a kid, I moved around a ton. <laughs> I lived in the Northeast. I lived in California. I lived in the Southeast, and it was the first time that I ever just really, truly felt at home in my body, um, and so that really started a lifelong affair <laughs> and adventure for me. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> you had left your Turkish prison then. Exactly. Yes. I like burst out of my cell. <laughs> so you burst out of your cell. You started yoga. You later moved to Manhattan. Yes. Then what happened? And What were you doing around 2002? And then what happened? 
I was, when I moved to Manhattan, I got a job. I worked in the uh, internet in the early days of the internet. Mm -hmm. I was employee number 25 at a women's website called iVillage.com. And we had an IPO, we had the whole shebang, and it was very exciting and sort of every day was a new um, challenge and adventure. But in 2002, I had been in that job for six years. I had was I was just sort of like feeling like, oh, do I want to sit at a computer the rest of my life? I was just sort of getting that feeling, that tingle, right? We, we get that pull sometimes of like something's trying to get our attention, but we don't know what it is necessarily. And we were having a round of layoffs because the boom days were over and I just felt myself raising my hand. And what I ended up doing was volunteering to get laid off. So I got a nice severance package and I went and did a yoga teacher training. And I was thinking... Maybe maybe what needs to change is I need to not sit in front of a computer and go like this all day. Da, 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 da. Maybe I need to actually like be in the room with other people and teach yoga. Yeah, I love yoga. And the irony is that I did so much yoga and we had to meditate every day and keep a journal. I mean, there was just a ton of reflection and a ton of um, quiet. Mm -hmm. And what I heard was that what I really wanted to do and had always wanted to do, I mean, if you talked to me when I was a kid, or if you looked at my activities at, from my school days, you would have known that what I wanted to do was be a writer. And I had never really even allowed myself to consider it because how crazy is that? Um, but I just, I heard that information very clearly during mm -hmm. all that practice. So what I did when I finished up my yoga teacher training is that I didn't start teaching yoga classes. What I did is I started a blog. And I'm still running that website today. It's called MsMindBody.com. And that is where I basically give my little, when I was in yoga teacher training, they told us to always have a little nugget yep. a philosophy or just a story that you built your class around. And so my blog is all my little nuggets. And it's a lot of fun nuggets. And we'll, we'll talk about some of your nuggets in detail in just a little bit. So, so as you're starting this up, you end up moving to Jersey, Jersey. Oh, yes. <laughs> you have really done your research. Yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> yes. I was, um, well, this is actually right before I started my yoga teacher training. I had been dating. I was dating someone, and it seemed like it was progressing after 2001. I don't know if after 9/11 anybody else was in like they felt like they started making different life choices because all of a sudden it felt like life was very precious and we mm -hmm. were very present to that. So we decided to move in together in New Jersey, and two weeks later, this same boyfriend. My story is he dumped me for a 23-year-old named Chantel. So at the time, I was 33 years old. I felt very much like jilted for the younger woman. Um, and that was, you know, a big kind of crisis in my life. But it was, all, it just worked out so well because that was when I was just starting the yoga teacher training. I had like all that time and focus on myself. It just really helped me heal. And helped me see that like yoga practice isn't just about being on your mat. It helps you deal with things like breakups. It makes sense. And what a perfect time and energetic space to take a deep dive. Yeah. I mean, I kind of had no choice, but that was, I can see now that that was a gift. Yeah. So going from there, what does an orange bow tie have to do with anything? <laughs> so I, as I mentioned, the teacher training was a year long. So I broke up and moved back from New Jersey to Manhattan at the beginning. And at the very end of the yoga teacher training, I went to a uh, party. A friend of mine just on a random Friday night said, hey, what are you doing tonight? I got invited to this party. Do you want to come? I was like, what kind of party? She said, well, it's a prom party. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> and it was a party for grownups where mm -hmm. you dressed as if you were going to prom. So I, I happened to have a hideous dress in the back of my closet. So I put it on. We went to the prom party. I got there and I looked around and all the guys were wearing blue blazers and khaki pants or, or a tie with a pair of shorts, like not things that you wear to prom, you know, like that was just, they were not going for it, except there was one guy in the kitchen at the party who was wearing the most hideous tux I had ever laid eyes on. He had a white jacket, a frilly, ruffly purple shirt, actual tux pants and an orange bow tie. And I was literally like, who's that guy? <laughs> And uh, that is the man that I am now married to. Woo! So he was flying his peacock feathers. He had them spread out wide. I were, like it. Yeah. So after you're together, you um, maybe tell us what happened in Brooklyn in 2007. Brooklyn in 2007, I was pregnant. Yep. No, I wasn't. We had been married for a year. You're going to have to remind me. I feel like you know <laughs> better than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you were pregnant. You were yes. uh, about to give birth, and I and I think labor was laborious. Oh, yes, 
Yes, I had a really epic labor. Um, I started having regular contractions on Saturday night, and <clears throat> my baby was not born until Tuesday night. Um, we had been trying to have her at home. I have a mortal fear of hospitals and needles. Any kind of needle, like a needle in my arm is bad enough, but a needle in my spine just makes me want to get in the car and drive to Canada. So we were really trying to stay at home with the baby, but the labor took so long. And, uh, you know, we had started to have some very minor complications. Everything worked out fine, but we had to go to the hospital. And that was, you know, I had been writing my first book, which is called The Anywhere, Anytime Chill Guide, which was, I like to, I kind of jokingly refer to it as emergency yoga. It's like, oh, if you can't sleep, try this yoga pose. If you ate too much, try this yoga pose, that kind of a thing. And I had written it while I was pregnant thinking that it was for all my friends or all the people that I knew or you know people in my like my in-laws people who said they were too something to do yoga too mm -hmm. busy too inflexible too ADD too stressed to just and I was like no no you can actually do yoga and it will really help you in your normal life like just do this it doesn't matter if you only have 2 minutes you can do this and the funny thing is is they always say we teach what we need to learn of course and i was writing that book and not realizing how much i was going to need those 2 minute practices because it did feel for a very long time like i only had 2 minutes to myself and so i had to get that book out and use it for myself now, were you also using it during uh, labor to try to calm yourself down toward the end of it? Absolutely. I, you know, I, uh, I have what I lovingly call a shy uterus, meaning if I was around other people, I just like labor would stall and we would just be like, you know, looking at our watches. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I finally realized that I needed to just be by myself and I needed to listen to my breath. I needed to sort of get quiet. I needed to just get very, very present to what was going on in my body. And I feel like I actually had a conversation with my uterus where I was like, is everything okay? And, and I just heard like, everything's fine. Let's just stay in here. Um, and that's finally when labor started to turn around for me. So yes, I mean, I used, I used all those practices in multiple ways. I mean, some of it was physical stuff like squatting is really helpful to help the baby get out. And, you know, but uh, really it was just that ability to kind of just accept what's happening in the moment mm -hmm. and stay cool. Very cool. And then you were talking about the uh, the Anywhere, Anytime Chill Guide, writing that also uh, after you've delivered. And I guess, that I think this is something, and we have a, a lot of mommies. I was doing the math today, and it's between probably 50 and 60% of our audience is mommies. Mm -hmm. I, I never really did the math on that. So, hi, mommies out there. Okay. And, and one of the things that fascinated me, and I think a lot of moms or, uh, new, moms of newborns are going through this, the newborn baby was stressing you out. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. I, I am almost, it's like I'm allergic to babies a little bit. I mean, they're adorable, but when they scream, it's just, I mean, I'm sorry, when they, when they cry, it, you know, they're just doing what comes naturally to them, communicating their needs, I start sweating blood. I'm like, give me the baby. You know, I just can't relax. People are like, oh, teach the baby to soothe himself or let the baby cry himself to sleep. It just wasn't an option for me. I would just lose my mind. So yes, I realized too that we teach what we need to learn. Not only did I not have a lot of time, but I had a like just as strong a stress response as anybody out there. It didn't matter that I had already been practicing yoga for over 10 years at that point. And so your book comes out, then a few years later, it's second baby time. Yes. And, and how was second, how was, what did that do to your life? Well, uh, you know, this, uh, my, sec my son was born in 2010. So the Great Recession was sort of finally catching up to me. I was, had been working primarily as a writer for magazines in addition to running my blog. And all my regular magazines that I, closed, that I wrote for were closing right around the time that my son was being born. Um, and so I felt like I was kind of watching my career sort of dissolve in front of my eyes at the same time that I was trying to just, you know, take care of a new baby and figure out how to be a mom of two. I'm an only child. I knew I wanted two children and I was so excited about it. But at the same time, like if one screaming baby is stressful to me, then having two kids need me at the same time, I wouldn't let my husband leave me alone with the two kids for like four months or something. I'd be like, you can't. I <laughs> what if they both cry at the same time? So I was really, you know, I felt like I had a lot to do. And I was, I was obsessed with dinner time too, like getting the babies to sleep. So, so important to me, feeding them good food. You know, I wrote about health and wellness, including nutrition. Like I'd read all the information about how 
their brains are still developing. They need all these nutrients. So I was like, I have to make all our own food. And just dinner and bath and bedtime was so stressful to me. And I just felt like I had no time to myself, really. If I felt like I'd had little time to myself when I had one, by the time I had two, I was like, oh, something's got to give. And I was like, I know what it's going to be. I am going to stop doing any form of mind-body practice. I had managed to like keep my home yoga practice going and I would meditate and stuff when I only had one. But when I had two, I was like, I'm just going to stop doing that. So this was the three glass of wine practice. Yes, it was the three <laughs> glass of wine practice. I thought I was going to save myself so much time, but what I actually ended up doing was I no longer had any way to take my edge off. So mm -hmm. I would come out from putting the kids to bed because, of course, I wouldn't let my husband do it. And part of that was because I was breastfeeding. But part of it was because, I mean, let's be honest, I thought that I was the only one who could really do it. <laughs> and I would come out and I would just be like, sort of revved up. And I would reach for a glass of wine. And I still have, I believe in wine. I love it. I think it's important to, like, to drink with friends and to relax and to enhance a good meal. But I started to drink two glasses of wine and I'm after like one and three quarters glasses it starts to affect my sleep in which I wake up at 2 a.m which I hear is pretty common and sometimes I was drinking three glasses of wine sometimes it was a whole bottle of wine because I just needed some way to calm down and then so that interrupted my sleep even more than having two children two years or under then I started uh, just dragging just being so tired so I would reach for carbs like give me the bagel, give me the pasta, give me the cookies, what have you, to try and give myself an energy boost. So that was like giving me a spare tire, mm -hmm. which made me feel worse about myself. So really what I was doing was my poor husband, he was there and he wouldn't scream or he wouldn't, I keep using the word scream. My children don't really <laughs> scream, but they, they would, you know, if you raise your voice at my kids, they definitely start crying. Like if there, he was somebody I could sort of like <clears throat> make digs at, like relieve some stress on. I'm not recommending this, but that's what happened. And so we were fighting. And it was just like this downward spiral. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, shall I tell you how I got out of it? Please do. Okay. It wasn't until I realized I am already sitting in a quiet room every night for 10 minutes while I nurse the baby to sleep. Mm -hmm. I can't move. I am immobilized. <laughs> and it's, and I can't, you know, as long as I'm home, this is going to happen. What if I just started meditating while I did that Beautiful. and I did the most remedial meditation technique that I know of not remedial but what I mean is you can't mess this up you don't have to be some kind of a master to be able to do it it is counting your exhales and when you get to 10 you start again at one you always know where you are you always know what you're supposed to be thinking. You know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't want to meditate because they're like, what's going on in there? Am I supposed to not be thinking? Like, you're supposed to be counting your breaths. That's what you're supposed to be doing. And it was the most magical thing. It, it wasn't anything that I needed to add to my to-do list. I would just n meditate. Baby would fall asleep. I would put him down. I would come out, and I did not have an edge that needed taking off. Then I could sit down and have a conversation with my husband instead of being like, why did you do the dishes? Um, which is something that we used to fight about quite a lot. Awesome. Not awesome about the fighting about the dishes, the <laughs> awesome about the meditation. And I'm sure baby was experiencing more bliss from that as well. Yeah, I like to think so. I like to think so. So then you move from there, as I understand, to Providence, Rhode Island, which is where you're speaking to me today. And, yes. and I'm thinking about moves because this is our first show since we've done our move. And moves can be epic, can't they? Oh, my goodness gracious. I mean, even the best moves for the greatest reasons are still... <laughs> really stressful, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just don't know how you have a non-stressful move. I'm pretty sure it's an impossibility. Well, I think that messiness is actually necessary. There's a certain amount of you have to break free of gravity yes. in order to get the energy flowing, sort of like getting chi moving again, get unstuck for yes. the next phase of your life. So you need that messiness. Yes. Yes. And you need that like kind of level of urgency to just be like, I don't need this. I don't need that. <laughs> you just lighten your load. You know, you have to. Yeah. So you moved to Providence and things felt better there? Yes. I moved to Providence. Things did feel better. I mean, my kids, my daughter was old enough for preschool then. We found a wonderful daycare for my son. We were still, we were stabilizing um, in terms of our personal lives and also just getting out of New York. We didn't have such a high monthly payment. So we had a little bit more breathing room in mm -hmm. terms of didn't need to take every job that came across the transom, whether we liked it or not. Um, but I still felt like I needed a little bit of help getting clear on what I really wanted to do. So if I created this space for myself, so what was I going to use it for? 
And I ended up hiring a coach to help me figure it out. I mean, really, when she asked me what I wanted, I was like, I want to know like, how to get my writing career back. How do I make more money as a writer? And what happened, though, was I found it so incredibly helpful to have a loving and objective person give me some perspective on my thoughts, suggest things that were possible for me that mm -hmm. I never would have considered possible for myself. I was like, wow, this is really powerful. And what I ended up doing was doing my coaching training because I realized that that was something that I wanted to incorporate. I already had this background of helping people reduce their stress and sort of access that information, those little calls, those little pings, right? But I realized that it's it's kind of stressful to figure out what to do with that information, you know, on your own. And if you have someone holding you accountable and helping you, you know, shine a flashlight on your next step, you can really make some powerful changes. So that's how I diversified. I, I love it. And, and I coach here as well. And what I like to say is I like to steal Einstein's quote, which is you can never solve a problem from the same level of energy from which it was created. You right. need to be able to step outside of it. So when somebody's going through many of the same challenges that you've been through, yes. they can't see those things unless they're working with you and, and you're able to step back outside of the picture and help them see what's going on. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, it's so cool. I just, I just love it. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. So let's go from there. Let's talk about a few fun things in your blog. Then we're going to dive, dive into the book and look at a top 10 list. First off, what is an energy leak and how do we plug it? Okay. So an energy leak is something that, so I kind of can, I like, I ask people to sort of imagine a bowl. A bowl <laughs> contains all your energy, everything, you know, and that energy is what you use. It's not necessarily what my grandmother used to call pep. I'm talking about like just how you show up in the world, how much focus you have, how much passion you're able to share with other people and how much you're able to get done. And then an energy leak is like a hole in the bowl, kind of like a colander. So it's either it's something that you have to do on a regular basis that really doesn't serve you at all and only sort of drains you, but you just maybe aren't aware of how much is draining you. So you keep doing it. Or maybe you just think, well, it's something that I have to do, like the laundry <laughs> and there's no way around this. Um, and you know, that's just one little example. And so we all have like this bowl, our bowls all have all these holes in them. And I am a huge proponent of doing multiple things. Like I am not one of those people who's going to tell you, you can only, you can't do multiple things. Well, you have to choose. I mean, listen, I'm a mom and I'm a business owner and I'm a service provider and I want to get involved in my kid's school. Like I think it's all important. It's all meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to do it all, but I can't do all those important things and, you know, do every dish as soon as it's done. Uh, like kind of being uh, attached to this idea that your house has to be perfect can be a leak because it can be a way that you distract yourself like, oh, well, I can't go do this important thing because I've got dishes to do. So I'm going to do the dishes first and then I'll do the other thing. But you may not ever get to the other thing. So you have a really nice clean kitchen, but you're not doing kind of what's really calling to you. So that's the idea of an energy leak. It's sort of identifying the things that are not serving you or serving the world and figuring out what to do about them. And sometimes, you know, you could delegate that or you can uh, minimize it somehow. But sometimes the leak is actually your resistance to the thing itself, which is a whole topic that we could talk about. But. Well, let's, let's go down that road a little bit because I think, I think that is really important that we're, it's distracting us, deliberately distracting us from the thing we get or need or want to do the most and maybe you're too scared to do. Right. Sure. Yes. So you could say, well, I can't possibly do that because I have to you know, just do something that's not important. I don't know. Or go through your inbox <laughs> and beat out your inbox. I mean, listen, I love an organized inbox too, but if that's going to, if it's a question between organizing my inbox and writing a chapter of a new book or getting an idea down for a blog post, you know, the choice is pretty clear that you got to do the important stuff first. Um, unless sometimes you can use distraction to your advantage. Um, if you know that that's what you're doing, though, you have to be aware of it. What does that mean? How do we do that? Well, you know, I talk to a lot, you know, a lot of people I talk to are like, oh, I'm such a bad procrastinator. I do all this stuff except what I know I'm supposed to do. And I think that if you can sort of accept that I, I'm that way, I, it's hard for me to sit down and just like in a blaze of glory and write. I mm -hmm. need to feel a little bit like, oh my gosh, I have to get this down now because I only have so much time or something. I need to have a little sense of urgency. Do I wish 
that I could be another way and sit down and just write in a blaze of glory? Yes. But for whatever reason, I need a little bit of a sense of urgency. So what I'll do is I'll say, well, you know what? I'm going to putter for 30 minutes. I'm going to go, you know, do the thing, plant my plants or weed the garden or something. And I think that A, it does help me create the urgency that I need. And B, it gives me an opportunity to like do a little thinking before I sit down and try and just be amazing. <laughs> so I find that I'll have a really great idea if I'm doing something beforehand. But I have to be mindful that I'm doing that, mm -hmm. right? I can't, because otherwise I'll just say, oh, well, I did the weeding. Now I think I'm going to go clean my closet. <laughs> and I could just spend all day doing that kind of stuff. I love to putter around the house. So I really could spend all day doing that kind of stuff. So. I'm sorry. I want to write my book, but it's time to iron the goat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a good one. That would be a good chapter. <laughs> now, what's, what's really cool, and I, I do this before when I'm prepping for interviews, mm -hmm. is I'm going, I've got X amount of time left. That's more than enough time. And now there's, there's um, Parkinson's Law, which says you'll take as much time as you have for a given task. But why not take yourself away from it, force yourself to have a tighter deadline, and when you're away from it, that's when the ideas pop absolutely. that you wouldn't have thought of. Yes, absolutely. Uh, pretty much you can bank on it. You know, I mean, maybe 5% of the time you don't get anything, you don't get any ideas, but I would say like 95% of the time you do. Yeah. So going from there, what is a, what is a long line of soakers and how'd you keep from hating your husband? <laughs> so here's a little bit. Yes. Okay. So a long line of soakers. So I mentioned that my husband and I used to fight about the dishes because mm -hmm. the way I saw it, I knocked myself out to make these beautiful homemade dinners for our babies. Then I would go put the children down and I just felt like, you know, while I was doing all those things, having done all those things, I should be able to walk out of the kids' rooms at night and the, the kitchen would be sparkling and my husband would just be, you know, waiting for me and we could <laughs> have a deep conversation where we figured out all our problems. Um, and what would happen is my husband just has a different idea of what a clean kitchen is than I do. And I think that that's pretty common in couples. There, you know, you, your cleanly, your ideas about what cleanliness means don't always line up. Um, and what would happen is he would he would do the dishes. He absolutely would. But he would he soaks the pots, mm -hmm. and you know I would kind of just want to come out of the room and have everything be really done, like clean slate for tomorrow morning. And he would be like, "Well, there's no point in me." It, there's no point in me like using my elbow grease to get those pots clean where if we just soaked them, I could do them in the morning. Like, what's the difference? And so I would say, hun, are you going to clean these pots? And he would say, oh, I come from a long line of soakers. That's actually the line I that he it. would use, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> not everybody finds amusing, but he's my husband. So thankfully, I do find that amusing. <laughs> I blogged about that on my website, which that post is three years old and I am continuing to get tons of comments on it to this day. And people are like, a long line of soakers. Are you kidding me? Sounds like a jerk. He's not a jerk, but he just, that was clean to him. So we had to kind of, I have a whole story about how my energy around what I thought the dishes, the kitchen needed to look like at the end of the night happened. But I used to just, you know, silently hate him. I mean, when I saw the kitchen and it wasn't clean to the extent that I thought it should be clean, and I kind of went through this whole process where I would get kind of martyry and be like, well, I guess I just have to be the one to do the dishes around here. Like I have to do everything around here. And I would go in there and like clean the dishes. And then finally I would sit down and I'd be like, oh, finally I can relax now that I did your job. Um, and then I kind of started to shift out of that a little bit. And I was like, well, I'm the one who cares about the kitchen being perfectly clean. So if it's really that important to me, then maybe I should just do it because that it, I'm helping myself. Mm -hmm. um, and then I actually got to the point where, you know, it's just sort of like moving through these levels of energy and the way that I regarded that sink full of soaking pots. And to be clear, it's not like the kitchen was a mess. It was, it was literally the pots in the sink that were driving me crazy. And then finally I was like, well, maybe it is okay for the pots to sit in the sink overnight. Like, is that really hurting anybody? I mean, maybe we could just like enjoy our one hour together that we have before we both pass out and we could just watch a show or have a talk. And kind of once I lost my heat around it, once I stopped immediately getting triggered by it, guess what? My husband started doing all the dishes. In fact, not only did he start doing all the dishes, he, he, he worked out this whole system where he, now he listens to podcasts on his phone <laughs> And he clips an um, oven it. mitt to his belt and to put his phone into the oven mitt. And he's like, babe, this is the greatest thing. you got to blog about this. <laughs> 
And it really wasn't because I manipulated his behavior. It was, I was like, I changed the energy that I brought to it. And so then he could change the energy that he brought to it. And we got out of this locked dynamic. Awesome. That's kind of what I like to do with my clients. You know, we can do that in a lot of different areas of our life. One of the cool things you did there, well, you did many things, but one of the things you did is, is you brought awareness to your trigger and you said, what's really triggering me here? What's really going on? Right. Yes. And you know what it was? It was that I felt like I couldn't relax until everything was done. Mm -hmm. I needed this. I wanted to feel like everything was done. Guess what? That's a fallacy. That, not, that is not true. The, things will be done when you're dead. And then who knows? Like maybe we're not done. Maybe we just, <laughs> you know, who knows what's happening on the other side. But, uh. I, yeah, and so it would really bother me that not only did he not clean the dishes, but you know what he was doing? He was kicking it on the couch. He was relaxing, and I felt like I couldn't relax until I was done, and so he was doing something that I really wanted to do that I would never allow myself to do, and mm -hmm. so I sort of got mad at him when really I could just do it. <laughs> and then kick back and relax on the couch yourself. Yes, yes, or do whatever. Uh, that's a little bugaboo of mine in that, like, you know, as a new mom, you want to be able to do nothing. I do think that that is a very valid thing. But, you know, maybe I would want to, like, knit or do something that actually brings me joy, I think. That, but, yes, kicking it to whatever definition makes you happy. I like it. So let's talk about kicking it to one more thing, then we're going to deep dive into the book, okay. which Great. is kicking it with singing your brain out in the car. <laughs> I love this one so much. This this, I feel like, is a major, major part of my personal sanity mm -hmm. strategy. Um, and it's actually been backed up by science that singing reduces levels of salivary cortisol. So the levels of cortisol that are in your saliva. Mm -hmm. Cortisol is a stress hormone that is released by your kidneys and it you know, works in tandem with adrenaline. And I've been learning so much. I've been working on a book for a ghostwriting client and learning so much about the vagus nerve, which is a nerve that like... It's all in our face and goes down to our gut, and it is a huge modulator of the stress response. And so things like, I mean, if you think about a crying baby, as we were talking about before, when you're trying to soothe a, a crying baby, what do you do? You look it in the face, and you're like, ooh, ha, ha, and you start to make faces at it, and they'll start to make faces back to you, and that can get them out of a really stressful moment. Well, the same is true for us. We can talking and singing and uh, yawning and all these things that sort of it stimulate the vagus nerve in our face can help really create a different physiological state in our body. Plus, singing your brains out is just so incredibly cathartic and fun and it helps you have a little bit of levity and lightheartedness, which really takes the sting out of stress as well. So I think it's great to listen to the radio, but I think that everybody should also have a couple of CDs in the car that they know all the words to. And when you're having a bad day, you just pop in that sucker. It doesn't matter how many times you've listened to it before. You can sing every word. You're going to feel differently when you get to where you're going. Woohoo! <laughs> and that, that helps you also, you mentioned in your book, uh, helps you go from uh, instead of road rage to road grace. Yes. Yes, it does. It does. I, I can't resist. There's one more I got to go for before we go into the book, which is doing downward dogs in your closet. Oh, <laughs> yes. So when we moved to Providence, we had been living in Brooklyn where we had a very, we had a two bedroom apartment. I mean, our second child slept in a closet. Mm -hmm. um, that was also my office and also our closet. So it was doing triple duty. Wow. We moved to Providence and all of a sudden we had all this space. In fact, our closet wasn't even necessarily a closet. It was kind of its own room. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had the luxury of setting out a yoga mat and never having to roll it up for the first time. It was amazing. And what I love about setting up a dedicated space for any kind of practice in your house is that even when you don't go there and do a downward dog in your closet, which is what I would do whenever I had a chance, but even on those days when I didn't, that wasn't available to me, I could just look at that space that I had set up and be like, oh, <laughs> you know, like I kind of got a contact relaxation, a contact high from the energy that I had infused in that space because that's where I would go and spend, you know, a few minutes every day. Um, and, you know, one down dog a day really keeps the doctor away. It is kind of a complete yoga practice in one pose, and I recommend it for everybody. And what I love about this is, is you talk about triggers in your book in a different way, and we may actually get there, but this is a, a, a positive trigger where every time you go into the closet, boom, take one moment out. Yes. And, and so you attach those things. Yes, it's true. It becomes like a, a tractor beam. 
Yeah. So let's let's go from there and let's tractor beam our way into the clouds. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's do it. So one of the exercises that I have in my new book, Stress Less, um, these are 100 exercises. They're mindfulness exercises, so they're not necessarily a yoga pose. There may be one or two yoga poses in there, but this is really like things that you can consciously decide to do in a couple of minutes and you really don't need any tools and can create a big shift in your mindset and in your mood and just your emotional stability. And one of those is watching the clouds. So I think this is a really great sort of, this is meditation is what it is, is you on a beautiful day like I am experiencing here in Rhode Island today. I'm so happy that it's the first sunshine we've had in like two and a half weeks. You go outside and you watch the clouds. Of course, you could do this from inside out a window too. But you watch the clouds and just like don't do anything else but watch the clouds. Like you'll notice that a dog head, a cloud that looks just like the shape of a dog head will slowly morph into an ice cream cone. Even in those moments while you're sitting there and watching it, I mean, I think we sort of don't think about the clouds very much. We think they're kind of static. I mean, if you asked us, we, we would probably have an awareness that they are moving, but we wouldn't think that they move that quickly. And if you sit and watch a cloud, I mean, you can even watch a cloud for five minutes and it may completely disappear. Um, like a little puff can just evaporate into nothing. And it's amazing. Even like a dense like gray bank of clouds it feels like oh my gosh this is that's like a solid wall if you look at it you'll see that there's like a little bit of mist that's swirling around there is some movement there and it's really this is an, an a metaphor for our thoughts so this is what meditation has us do with our thoughts you just observe your thoughts and you watch them change and you realize how often they change and how they're just not um that you can't stick a fork in them. It means they're not necessarily true, which is incredibly liberating. And when you're looking at those clouds, you're not thinking. That's right. That's right. So let's go from staring at clouds to daring to get bored. Okay. Oh, I think this is so important. Uh, especially in our culture of, you know, your phone is dinging, your inbox number is rising, the number of likes on your Facebook post is climbing. Like there's just so many ways that if you have two minutes to yourself, I mean, it could be at a red light. I am guilty of wanting to check my phone at a red light. It could be at a doctor's office. It could be going to the bathroom. You know, it could be any time that you don't have something that you absolutely have to do right now. You're going to reach out for something to um, distract you from just doing nothing. And actually, we need boredom. We need to do nothing. It is, a, you know, it's like everything in life. We need darkness to appreciate the light and vice versa. <laughs> we need winter to appreciate the summer. We need boredom to appreciate the constant stream of information that we have, which we may love and may get a lot of value from. But if you don't take the opposite side of just being still and being fallow, then that, um, <laughs> that, information is going to overwhelm you and it's going to raise your stress state and it's just going to make you much more reactive. It makes total sense. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I relish the time. You, you, I don't want to be at the dentist office, but I'm, I'm even thinking, I'm like, put me in a chair, put me anywhere, give me a few <laughs> minutes to do nothing. And I'm like, right. oh. <laughs> see, that's so great. That's so great. I think that we, you know, we're, we're like physiologically sort of addicted to what's next? What's mm -hmm. next? What's next? Um, and so we have to build up our muscles around nothing being next. Like yeah. just, this is it. <laughs> so speaking of building up muscles, you have a really cool technique. It's kind of actually dovetailing kind of on the downward dog. I, I kind of alluded to it earlier. But you have something called pick a trigger. Mm. Uh -huh. Yes. So I am a huge fan of the power of very simple and short mindfulness practices to really positively influence your well-being and your stress levels. But the way to, and I think that a great way to do it and make it doable and do something that you do daily without really thinking about it is to tie it to things that you know are going to happen in your day. So that mm -hmm. could be something like a routine, like you, you know you're going to drive to work and you're going to turn off the car and you're going to get open the door and walk in. So you could take three breaths in the car before you walk into the office because, hey, that's just part of what you do and you turn off the car. But you also know that you're going to get annoyed by something. <laughs> I mean, you're, you know that it may be for all the moms out there. I mean, I love my kids so much. They, I hear my name, I hear, I hear the word mommy like 
75 times a day. I don't know. And at some point I'm like, what? You know, I'm really <laughs> trying hard to not be like, what? Um, so I could use a good trigger that I use is every time I hear the word mommy, I just mm -hmm. take a breath. That's uh, awesome. It could be a commercial if you're watching TV, although I know we don't really watch TV that much that way anymore where you actually watch the commercials. It could be um, a doorbell or if there's some, it's something that drives you crazy, you can take it and remember that when every time you hear that, it's just a reminder to do something that makes you feel better. And that is like, that's like martial arts, right? You take the, the energy of some of your opponent and you reverse it you like capitalize on it and send it back in the direction you want to go i like it so we'll do we'll do some energy some some tai chi driving tai chi work here and oh. go from there and talk about the red light meditation oh nice <laughs> okay great well here's an example of taking something that you know you're going to encounter on a daily basis as long, so long as you drive a car on a daily mm -hmm. basis you're going to encounter a red light and in, at the red light, instead of like maybe inching out into the intersection to see, you know, who's coming or reaching for your phone, you could say, oh my gosh, I'm at a red light. I can just take as many breaths as I can, pay attention to as many breaths as I can until the light turns green. This also completely works if you're a pedestrian living in New York City. Red lights are just as um, important to people walking on the street as they are to people driving cars. And again, a red, at a red light in New York City, if you're walking, you, you, know, you could literally be like trying to get out there and see if any cars are coming so you could scoot across because we just get locked into this gotta keep going mode. Or you could just remember to like look up, watch the clouds. It doesn't necessarily have to be your breath if that feels a little bit esoteric for you. It could be just like observing, see what you can see. I like it. Let's go from there to a really critically important meditation, a piece of chocolate. It's my favorite. It's my favorite. So, um, again, tying your meditation to something that you do every day. I absolutely eat chocolate every day. It could be the kind of thing that you just pop in your mouth because that's what you do and you just keep going. Or it could be an opportunity for you to slow down a little bit. A piece of chocolate is actually, I mean, everything is, but it's such a microcosm for how connected we are mm -hmm. to everybody else on this earth. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, chocolate is grown in tropical places. So people halfway across the world needed to plant the chocolate, the co cacao bush. They needed to pick the seeds. They needed to grind the beans. The chocolate is fermented. Somebody had to ferment them. Somebody had to, you know, put it into some form that they could then get shipped. Someone had to pick up that package. Someone had to drive the boat, the, the, the boat or the car or however it got to you. And then once it got to America, there's like 30 other people who are involved in that piece of chocolate. And then not to mention the people who work at your store and then you picking it up at the store and bringing it to your house. And so you could just like put the chocolate in your hand for a minute and just try and like, and just thank everybody who was involved in bringing that piece of chocolate into your hand at this very moment. I, I've got a good name for it. Yeah. Uh, the meta chocolate meditation. Oh, I love it. I love it. That is genius. So <laughs> let's, let's go from there. And, and I was going over this list with, with Jessica, my, my wife. She's the producer as well beforehand. We were coming up with our, our top ones. And she said, oh, you've got to ask about this one. Don't do something you don't want to do. Mm. So... Yeah, I think that sometimes you just have to give yourself a pass. I, I mean, listen, we're all, I tell my kids every day, I mean, it's an important lesson. Sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do. That's absolutely true. But are there things, and this is kind of related to that whole idea of plugging up energy leaks, right? If there's something that you just really don't want to do, you aren't getting anything out of it. It could be hanging out with people who mostly gossip and you feel sort of like you need to take a shower afterwards, you know? Um, it could be... I don't know, like just chatting with a neighbor while you're on the dog walk and it just takes you so long. Like you could just go a different way and it ends up your, your dog walk ends up taking this really long time and then it becomes a stressor to you. It is okay to use your agency to create a more uplifting experience. I am giving everyone who's hearing this podcast permission to not do something that you don't want to do. Thank you. That also has to do with our energy level and the shift of, of again, dropping the energy down by doing something you don't want to do versus bringing it up. 
Yes. So let's, let's go through a few more of these. We're going to go through them kind of okay. quickly so that we can sure. get to a brief meditation. Uh, one, uh, my wife Jessica, again, was doing just before this, which is particularly, um, I don't know if easy, good is the right word, but we don't have a couch yet. So she was enjoying a beautiful lying on the floor. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, listen, I mean, every mind-body practice considers the earth, the ground, to be a source of support, a source of, source of stability and strength. And of course it is. I mean, without the earth, like, where would we be? We would, we would be floating through space, and that would really be uncomfortable, and we would not live long. Um, and yet we spend most of our time floating above it, like we're in the car, or we're in our bed, or we're lying back on the couch. And so it can be just such an immediate way to literally ground yourself and to also like let your body come, let your spine come into its natural curves to just get on the floor and lie down. And not only that, but it's almost like a form of exercise because you have to, you have to squat, you have to use your knees, you have to use your hands. I mean, it's going to behoove you. <laughs> the older you get, as someone who's just turning 47 today, I'm recognizing that time absolutely does pass. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in like the midlife all of a sudden. We need to be doing these things that help us stay vital as we age too. So it's good for you now, and it's good for you in the future. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Another one that that I read to Jessica, and she got all excited about, it, and then she realized she was typoing it. Um, she thought it was zenning up your cat. <laughs> 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 She's like, wow, cool, gotta ask. I'm like, I think that's cars. She's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I mean, a lot of us spend a lot of time in our cars. People have these, you know, pretty substantial commutes. And as a mom, I feel like my car can be one of the few places where I'm alone. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you look at your car and you think like, oh, that's how I slept the kids around, or that's how I go to the grocery store, or that's how I commute to and from work, and that is stressful. Like, it's kind of easy to make this association between car and stress. But it's also pretty easy to turn your car into a little rolling oasis. You mm -hmm. can put some calming music in there. You can put a picture of something, people that you love or a place that you love um, behind your visor. Uh, you can put like a pretty rock or a shell. It's just something to remind you of things that are relaxing and restorative to you. And then you've got your own little like protective, stress-free bubble. Zen mobile. Exactly. Oh, that's another good one. You're good at this. <laughs> little practice. Thank you. <laughs> What's it mean to soothe yourself to sleep? So... I, one of the things that I studied when I was writing my first book is acupressure, which is do-it-yourself acupuncture. You just use your hands and your fingertips to kind of access the points on your body where your chi is closest to the surface. So what you do when you're lying in bed, I mean, when you're lying in bed and you can't sleep, I'm not gonna, I don't think it's going to work, but what you do is um, you lie on your back and mm -hmm. you rest one hand on your heart and one hand on your solar plexus, which is the like really soft squishy part <laughs> just beneath your breastbone and between yep. your ribs it's also a source of personal power for you and when you do that you're accessing the conception vessel that's a channel of energy that's your most primal and when you do that when you rest your hand on your heart and your solar plexus like that it uh, it just soothes that like most basic energy in your body that's going to like that rules when you're asleep and when you're at peace and it's going to help send a message that it's time to be at peace and help you just release into sleep. You stay there for a couple of minutes and then you bring your top hand down to your belly underneath your belly button. And yeah. so also what you're doing is you're helping draw the energy away from your head, which is where your thoughts are, which is probably what's keeping you up and down towards your core and to the lower extremities of the body where it can be released and it doesn't have to just like zip, zip, zip around anymore to help you sleep better. I like it. I also feel somehow like I'm being cradled or nurtured as I'm doing this. Yes, it's so soothing. It's a little bit like uh, uh, your own weighted blanket. You know how lying under a weighted blanket is supposed to be soothing? <laughs> it's pretty much how I sleep. <laughs> yeah, right? You're just sort of emphasizing that feeling and directing it to some pretty important spots on your body. I like it. Let's go from there from another really important one, the importance of blowing bubbles. Oh, this is such a good one to do with kids. You know, everybody, you don't have to be a certain age to start to experience stress. Also, even if you don't have kids, this is a really fun way to blow up some stress, which I, I just kind of amplifies your efforts. And what you do is you blow bubbles. And as you blow the bubbles, you imagine that whatever is stressing you out is going into the bubble. And then you can watch the bubbles just float away and like flick, 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 explode and just like dissolve into the air. And 
you know, it could be a worry. It could be something you wish you hadn't said. It could be anything. Just blow it into the bubbles. It gets it out of your body. And even blowing the bubbles, like if you're really trying to get it far away from you, you're going to have to engage your diaphragm, which is how you trigger your body that everything is okay. Because that gets you, when your diaphragm gets locked, that's when you get locked into a stress response. So like a good... Will uh, par- parasympathetic bubble blow. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like we got some vagal response going on with the bubble blow too. <laughs> All right. Well, last one that I've gotten here then, um, one that I'm, I'm a very big fan of myself, the power of hugs. Mm. Yes. Oh my gosh. We all just... I mean, I wish I could wave my magic wand and we would all just cuddle more. There are actually professional, professional cuddlers where you could just go get spoon uh, instead of like getting a massage. But yeah, I mean, a hug is, first of all, it's going to, that physical touch is just going to get your oxytocin flowing, which is your contentment hormone. It's also going to make you feel connected to other people. You're probably, you ever notice when you're giving someone a hug, you just instinctively go, <sighs> you know, you take a deep breath. It's just like, it, it's it's a reset button for your stress levels, but it's also one that just feels really, really good. Of course, the other person has to want to hug you. So it's nice to ask, would you like a hug? <laughs> you, you've got me thinking. I'm not going to come up with the name of the movie right now. The sequel to Finding Nemo. Uh, oh, right Finding bef- Dory. Finding Dory. The cuddling on the road to save. I, I, I won't give it away I to everybody. But it yet. That's awesome. Oh my God. You've got to see the cuddle party taking up, taking place in the middle of the highway. I'll just leave it at that and oh, just gosh. hold on to your seat because you're going to cry laughing. Okay. Okay, great. I will watch. I will absolutely watch it. My son is such a big cuddler and we talk about like cozy. He once told us that he wanted to change his last name to cozy. So like <laughs> cuddling is a very big thing in our house. Very cool. All right. So let's get through a few quick wrap-up questions. First off, as a good coach, putting on my coaching hat, putting on your coaching hat, we need to give people homework today. What one homework assignment would you give people today to stress less? Well, if I could wave my, if I could just get everybody to walk away with one takeaway is that you always have the power to take a breath before you respond to something stressful. And even just taking that one breath will change the way you react. It will change. It will influence your results. It will influence your well-being for the better. And all you have to do, though, is remember in the moment. Anybody can take a deep breath and just pay attention to it. And it doesn't have to be the biggest breath you ever took. It could just be like, my son just said, Mommy, for the 75th time, before I say anything, I'm just going to... Yes, honey. You know, it just, mm-hmm. it takes like a fraction of a second. Beautiful. And then if Jessica was here, she would say, I need to ask a question on advice for parents. So parents for their kids, what would you tell parents to help their kids to stress less? Well, I would model, I mean, the things that we do are just so important. So let them see you taking care of your stress levels, be a bit transparent with them. You know, oh gosh, I had a stressful day. I'm noticing that my temper is a little bit short. I'm going to try and remember to take a breath before I do anything tonight. Who, you want to do it with me? That kind of a thing. Um, But you don't even necessarily have to be that direct about it. Like them seeing you meditate or stretch or get down on the floor or blow bubbles or sing in the car, you know, and they'll notice that it changes your energy and it it changes the way you interact with them. And they will absolutely remember. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. My daughter is constantly asking me like, what's your favorite this? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite color? I'm like, I can never choose a favorite. But Something that makes me so happy, okay, well, something I did last night Mm -hmm. instead of lying on the couch when I had 20 minutes to myself as I got outside and I planted some plants. Awesome. It just like fills me with yes. (laughs) Reading a great book for 15 minutes, just like something that is so absorbing and I just like the whole world fades away. Those are two of my top and taking a walk, just always any kind of weather. I'm so yeah. glad you mentioned that one because you have a lot on walking and your feet in the book and getting out there. Yes. Yes. I mean, we are, not, we are part of nature. We need to get out in it more, even if it's just walking around in your neighborhood. It does everybody a world of good. And finding a tree to love. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Hug a tree. Bonus points. Woohoo! <laughs> so where can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful book? 
The book is available on Amazon. That is probably the best place to go. I think they're having a pretty good price on it right now because mm -hmm. it's new. Um, it's available anywhere, though. I mean, it is always a wonderful thing for any book to go into your bookstore and ask them to carry it. It just, every author will just give you a huge thanks for that because as important as online sales are, there's just nothing like a bookstore saying, like, we love this book, our people love this book, we want to sell it. Uh, it is also available on my website, which is MsMindBody.com. That's like Ms. Jackson if you're nasty. I can send you an autographed copy if you come there. Um, so that's where it is. Very, very cool. And they can check out your blog as well and yes. lots more and tips and information. And sign up for my newsletter. Yes, you get a sample of my first book, um, The Anywhere, Anytime Chill Guide, if you sign up for my newsletter. And I'm working on a new website. I'm not sure when this podcast will come out or when you'll be people will be watching it. I mean, I'm sure it'll be archived. So I, I'm also working on a new freebie, which will be a decision-making matrix to help you like get clear on which choice you want to make, kind of incorporating all the stuff that we've been talking about and putting it into action in your life. Um, so check that out too. Very, very cool. And if this comes out in advance, there'll be a link to get you over to there as well? Yes, it will automatically redirect, so don't worry. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And if you didn't catch MsMindBody.com, come on over to InspireNationShow.com and we'll get you over to Kate as well. So before we do a really brief meditation, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? I, I, I want to share that, you know, there are actually some good things about stress and the goal isn't to necessarily wipe it out completely because that is an impossible goal and might make you even think that what's the point? I'm not even going to try. Mm -hmm. So just like we were talking about, sometimes you have to use, you have to create your own sense of urgency for yourself um, to, to just get curious about your stress, to definitely breathe your way through it and watch the clouds and do all these things that help you feel better. But also know that stress is often because can also happen for really positive reasons, like you're growing, you're doing something that's going to teach you something that's going to help you help people. And so it's not necessarily something, it's not the enemy, but it's something that we can befriend and work with more skillfully. Surf the wave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That's a mighty woohoo. <laughs> so do you have a brief meditation you wouldn't mind sharing with us today? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, since I'm outside and the mm -hmm. birds are chirping and the lawn, the leaf blowers are blowing and there's just so many interesting and delicious sounds, I would love to talk us through a brief listening meditation. So I invite you to find a comfortable seat with your spine extended, whatever that means to you. Don't have to be sitting on the floor, could absolutely be sitting in your chair, but you want your sit bones like really underneath you so, so that your spine can just like unfurl. Imagine that your head is a balloon and your spine is the string and the balloon is rising up toward the sky and so your spine is getting longer and longer and longer. And then if you can rest your hands on your thighs, but then draw them back toward you a little bit so that it opens up the top of the chest. And then close your eyes. As long as you're not driving. And what we're going to do is close the eyes, but open the ears. So typically we're trying to focus on one specific sound. But in this meditation, we're going to think more like a tape recorder, which records everything that it hears. And this is going to be the focus of your thoughts. Just notice everything that you can hear. And know that when your mind wanders, which I can pretty much guarantee that it will, all you have to do is recognize that you've started thinking and come back to focusing on what you can hear. How many layers of sound do you notice?
Is there a sound that's happening underneath all the other sounds? Keep coming back to what you can hear. Listening requires you to be receptive and being receptive requires you to soften. So when you notice that you've started thinking again, remember that all you have to do in that moment is a little bit less. And then to come out, imagine that you're opening your eyes but letting the world come into your eyes instead of projecting your eyes out into the world. Let that be the bridge between that receptive space that you were just in while we were meditating and the rest of your day. So I love that one because you can do it anywhere. I think you hired the bird for that one, too. <laughs> the sounds out here are so great. I didn't realize I can hear my neighbor's wind chime. Cool. cool. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Kate. This has been such a, a, a pleasure and a treat. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm really honored to be here. Thanks for sharing all this kinds of information with everybody. It's 500 and how many shows? It's 599. Real... That is quite an accomplishment. Wow. Hmm. So, Congrats. and baby stepping our way forward. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Got to crank it back up for the finish here. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying be well, have fun, get stress less, and stop stressing and start living and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you, Michael. Have a beautiful day. Enjoy the birds. Enjoy the wind chimes in the distance. Enjoy the sunshine. Thank you. Oh, I absolutely will. I'm going to go roll around in the grass now, I think. <laughs> Soak it up. I, I love it. I might do the same. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, InspireNationShow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>